Tis the season for child abandonment. It's Home Alone on Super NES Works, episode 27. Super NES Works has saved the worst for last, I'm afraid. These final episodes bring us a sad succession of games that fall well short of the standards we've come to expect from this console, a particularly unpleasant come down immediately following the excellent Super Castlevania 4. Super Castlevania 4 may not have worked perfectly as a Castlevania game, but it's still a great platformer loaded with interesting ideas and gorgeous music. Home Alone, on the other hand, not so much. The mediocrity of Home Alone probably shouldn't come as a surprise. This is, after all, a game dashed together to grift on the success of a family holiday comedy that exploded into a far bigger hit than I think anyone really expected. Kevin! Ah! Movie tie-in games don't have to be bad, of course. We've seen a few on Game Boy Works already that turned out well. Still, the genre's success ratio ain't great, and Home Alone upholds the numbers. The whole affair has a strangely 8-bit feel to it, as though it began life on a more primitive console and somehow ended up here. Yet despite giving this sensation, Home Alone is not actually a port of, say, the NES game to Super NES. Publisher THQ churned out Home Alone games for every console imaginable throughout 1991 and 92. And just about each and every one of them was different from the other. In fact, the Super NES version comes to us from Imagineering, the studio behind A Boy and His Blob. Meanwhile, the NES game was produced by Bethesda, back way before the Elder Scrolls days, which means that Fallout's 76 loudiness at least has historic precedence. The Super NES take on Home Alone is curiously the least imaginative and inventive of the bunch. It's nothing more than a clumsy platform collectathon packed with half-baked ideas and inconsistent rules. The movie Home Alone, of course, was a mammoth motion picture hit that rocketed to the top of the box office charts on the every kid charisma of its young star Macaulay Culkin. Culkin played a sort of Dennis the Menace type accidentally left behind by his family as they traveled out of town for Christmas, who ends up defending his home from some weirdly determined intruders who inexplicably call themselves the Wet Bandits. It's easy to see why Home Alone was a huge hit with kids. It's basically an exercise in wish fulfillment. Culkin's character, Kevin McAllister, gets to hang out at home without parental supervision and do all the dumb, unhealthy, but not particularly dangerous things kids like to do without parents around to supervise, like stay up late and eat junk food. And then when the bad guys invade, Kevin gets to be a hero by indulging in his naughtiest behavior, pulling painful pranks involving tar and nails to deter burglars from stealing his family's upper-middle-class treasures. It's all very innocent and dated in a way a 90s movie in a contemporary setting tends to be. There are no mobile phones to connect Kevin with his missing family, and the American upper-middle-class still exists here. Most of the games based on the film involve the concept of Kevin as home defender. For example, the NES game consists of 20-minute phases in which Kevin has to avoid the wet bandits while laying down traps to fend them off, a concept that almost seems to prefigure something like the tower defense genre. Imagineering's Super NES game, on the other hand, lacks this inventive element. You play as Kevin, running around your home, collecting treasures to deposit into a vault. The four stages here take place in the four wings of the McAllister home, which apparently has become a massive estate rather than the two-story cube seen in the film. Each stage spans three floors, the main floor, upstairs, and the basement, and gives players the same objectives. You need to gather up a specific quota of McAllister possessions and drop them down a chute into the basement vault. Once you've hit your quota, the basement unlocks and you make a dash to the vault to seal it shut and move along to the next stage. You're beset by the wet bandits in the upstairs floors, along with the hardened criminals they appear to have recruited for this heist. Besides Daniel Stern and Joe Pesci's bandits, you also have to deal with a dude who appears to be a 1920s Chicago bootlegger, a guy who tosses deadly looking fedoras at you, and a few others not seen in the movie. Your basement excursions are even wilder, pitting Kevin against creepy crawly rats, bats, and spiders. These sequences are much less convincing than the ones in Super Castlevania 4. At the end of every basement but the first, you have to defeat a boss by causing a heavy object to fall on its head. Survive somehow to the end of the fourth vault, and you win. That's more easily said than done, though. Home Alone is not an easy game to complete. I wouldn't call it challenging exactly, more like hard because of clumsy design. Kevin takes damage from making contact with any enemy or passive hazard, but the controls, collision detection, and enemy AI can make certain situations extremely difficult to navigate safely. By the third and fourth stages, the game just starts throwing hazards at you as soon as you enter a new screen, giving you no time to react. Kevin can weather a couple of hits before losing a life which rewards you with a photo scan of Culkin's famous aftershave reaction shot, and collecting pizza slices will eventually net you an extra life or two. But overall, life in the McAllister home can be short, nasty, and brutish. 
The saving grace here is that the levels feel like rough drafts for a proper game, so there are lengthy segments where you face no challenges at all. You kind of get the impression that this game shipped a few months before it was actually ready. But with its inconsistent pacing, stiff animation, awkward control physics, and seemingly placeholder sound effects. And that's to say nothing of your completely useless weapons. Kevin begins the game with a squirt gun, and can collect other projectiles along the way, including a slingshot, baseballs, and a BB rifle. For the most part, these are useless. The baseballs and rifle can stun foes, and the slingshot can interact with an extremely small number of objects in the environment, but there's really very little value to these purported tools. The seemingly incomplete nature of the game also comes through in the haphazard integration of the booby trap concept. There are a handful of places in which Kevin can use the environment to take out bad guys, either by dropping objects on their heads or luring them to walk over hazards. Well, lure is probably a strong word here. More like their idiot AI will cause them to walk in a straight line until they obliviously walk over the obstacle and die. Kevin can also be hurt by the same things as the bad guys, and if a bad guy touches a treasure, they'll rush off with it, preventing Kevin from adding it to his loot bin. In other words, there are some mechanics here that could have made for some interesting interactions and gameplay if Imagineer had finished the game. These exceptions appear so rarely, and the game is so brief that it all feels wasted. I don't know that we can blame Imagineer for Home Alone's rushed, sloppy feel. THQ was notorious for bringing out the worst in every developer it hired, and Imagineer was probably given 50 bucks and a long weekend to code this thing. The results are pretty bad, though. Most of the gameplay boils down to leaping awkwardly over bad guys and pressing up while in front of background objects to cause things hidden in unlikely places to pop out so you can collect them. Sure, there's a giant remote control truck that the wet bandits are desperate to steal hidden behind a painting of a flower. Sure, Kevin can use the countless unused RJ-11 jacks scattered haphazardly across the walls as platforms to reach the ceiling. Eh, why the hell not? Mobsters want to steal turtles, there's a stream of infinite ghosts in the basement, and someone hid life-giving pizza in the toilet. So who even really cares at this point? I really think the target audience for this game was people born in 1985. That extremely limited demographic would have been six years old when Home Alone for Super NES arrived, which would be exactly the perfect age to be enchanted with this game. They got to play as a kid, collecting toys and toilet pizza, in a huge house much like their own. That's a heady proposition for someone just barely learning to add two and two together, and I don't doubt that you could find a few passionate video apologias of Home Alone here on YouTube, created by 33-year-olds who had a love for this sorrowful excuse for a video game hardwired into their impressionable brains before their skulls had fully formed up. For the rest of us, though, nothing could be more unpleasant than being trapped home alone with this game. Next on Super NES Works, it's time to file for DeForce. 